During my senior year at Asbury College, I had the opportunity to, to take the trip of a lifetime. I had the opportunity to do my fall semester in the land of Israel. And so I was able to travel to Israel and study there and take classes there. And all of those credits were to be transferred to my degree at Asbury. So on September 5th, 1994, I, I boarded a little plane in Lexington, Kentucky, and I flew to Nashville, Tennessee. And then I boarded a, a bigger plane and flew from Nashville to Atlanta, Georgia. And then I got on an even bigger plane and flew from Atlanta, Georgia to London, England. And then I got on one more plane and flew from London, England to Tel Aviv, Israel. And then after arriving there, I, I got in a cab and I was driven to Jerusalem where I studied there for three months. The travel time alone on the airplanes, including layovers, was 23 hours. And so I was exhausted. But let me tell you, it was a trip of a lifetime. I was able to study under some world-class professors. I was able to uh, study Hebrew and take a class on Egyptology, and I was even able to travel down into Egypt for about six or seven days. I was able to take a class on the history of Israel. I, I took a course on the topography and geography of the Bible land, and we took a lot of trips. I visited Bethlehem and Nazareth and Capernaum. I got to see the Jordan River and Jericho and the Red Sea. I even got to travel to the Valley of Elah where David killed Goliath. And I even went down and got five smooth stones and kept them as a, a reminder of that story in the Bible. And so that trip, living in Israel for three months, studying there, being there during my fall semester of my senior year of college, it was a trip of a lifetime. But there was a real downside to that trip. I, I was incredibly homesick. Um, I miss my family. I miss my friends. I miss my college friends and the students there. Um, I missed America. I mean, I was in Israel, and I loved being there, and I loved studying, but uh, they spoke different languages. It was a different culture. And here I am, this Kentucky boy, studying in the land of Israel. And as far as I know, there was not another person there from Kentucky. And so I wore my UK cap everywhere I went, and I sure missed home. I missed my family. I missed my friends. I missed the country where I was raised. And, and what, what sustained me during that time was hope. I had this hope that when the semester ended, I would board a plane and I would fly back to London and then fly back to Atlanta and then eventually fly back into Lexington, Kentucky, get off of that plane, embrace my family, embrace my friends. And sure enough, that day came and what a great time it was to be reunited with my family. Trip of a lifetime, but also homesickness, sadness, even discouragement because I was away from my family. But what sustained me was hope. And, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about hope because we are going through some difficult times right now. And just as I was separated from my physical family, in a way right now we are separated from our spiritual family. We're not able to physically gather together right now as the body of Christ. And so we miss each other and there's some sadness. There may even be discouragement or depression. And so what I wanna talk to you today, I wanna talk to you about hope. And, and I want you to know hope is more than a feeling. Hope is not just an emotion. Hope is a God-given assurance that he is in control. I like what it says in Revelation 19, 6, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And I believe that. And no matter what is happening in our society, no matter what is happening with the COVID-19 pandemic, I believe the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And so hope is a God-given assurance that he is in control. And, and hope is a deep-seated expectation that better things are ahead. And I want to assure you, we will get through this. 
this too shall pass. And so I want to talk today about hope. And as you read through the Word of God, what you will find is, is that hope is a very important biblical virtue. I mean, even God is described in Romans 15, 13 as the God of hope. So when you think about who is this God that we serve, he is actually called the God of hope because he is the one who gives hope. He is the one who sustains hope in his people. And so hope is a very important biblical virtue. Uh, we, we see that hope is one of the three cardinal Christian virtues in the New Testament. Do you remember a passage like 1 Corinthians 13, 13? It says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And of course, the, the greatest is love, but the three big ones are faith, hope, and love. Hope is one of the three cardinal Christian virtues. And I believe hope is also a defining characteristic of a believer. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you should be known as a person of hope. You remember what it says in 1 Peter 3, 15? It says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. And so that assumes that non-believers are going to recognize that we're people of hope and that they're going to ask us, Give me a reason in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of trials and hardships, why do you still have hope? Give me a reason for that hope. And so this verse assumes that as believers in Jesus Christ, a defining characteristic of our lives, what we're known for is hope. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about hope because you may be out there today listening and you're struggling with anxiety, you're struggling with discouragement, you may even be struggling with depression, and I want you to know we serve a God of hope. And he wants you to have hope during this time. And hope is not just a feeling, it's not here today and gone tomorrow. Hope is this God-given assurance that he is in control. It's an expectation that better things are ahead and that, that's the hope that we have as believers in Christ. So we're going to look in the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at two Psalms in particular. They're back-to-back, -back, and they're Psalms 42 and 43. And so if you have a Bible there at home, I, I encourage you to open it up to Psalm 42 and 43. We believe that these two Psalms were meant to be read together. One of the reasons we believe that is there's a common refrain in both Psalms, and I'll point that out in a, in a few moments. Also, Psalm 42 kind of has a title to it, but Psalm 43 does not. And in some of the ancient manuscripts of, of the Hebrew Bible, these two Psalms were actually uh, compiled together as one Psalm. And so we believe these two Psalms should be read together. They're a unit of thought and, and that thought that is being conveyed is the thought of hope. And you'll see that word hope uh, throughout this uh, particular psalm, uh, both psalms, Psalms 42 and 43. So let me begin in verse 1. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And, and by the way, this is that common refrain that we see throughout these two psalms. And notice that the psalmist speaks to himself. And it's okay sometimes to speak to yourself. Uh, the one thing you don't want to do is answer yourself, but it is okay to speak to yourself. And he is speaking to his soul and asking his soul questions and admonishing his soul, kind of looking in the mirror and saying, 
You need to keep your hope in God. And so let's look at this refrain, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. And that's what we see throughout these Psalms. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon. We're going to come back to this. Mount Hermon was the northernmost part of Israel, the boundary of the land of Israel. Mount Hermon was the place where the waters flowed down into the river Jordan. And so the psalmist evidently is away from Jerusalem. He's either at the northernmost part of Israel or maybe even outside of the boundaries of Israel and therefore not able to come to Jerusalem to worship. And so this has a very relevant point for us today with what we're going through. But again, he says that this is from the land of Jordan and of Hermon from Mount Miser. He says in verse 7, Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. It's like he's overwhelmed, like the water is just flowing over him, and he just feels overwhelmed by life. And maybe today you feel overwhelmed by life. But look at verse 8. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, where is your God? Here's that refrain again, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm 43, vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me, for you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Again, this refrain, third time in these two Psalms, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. One of the reasons why I think we love the book of Psalms so much is because of its raw emotion. It's a book of reality. It's not a sugar-coated book where the, the believer is always going through good times and they're always up and always happy. Uh, we see the psalmist on the mountaintop, and we see the psalmist in the valley. But whether he's on the mountaintop or in the valley, he's crying out to God, and he's putting his hope in God. And that's what I want to challenge you today. Put your hope in God. Right now, we don't know about the changing circumstances. We don't know how long we'll have to do what we're doing and practice social distancing and restaurants being closed and all these different things. But I'll tell you one thing that will not change, and that is the living God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So keep your hope in him. You know, as we go through these Psalms, I want to look at a few questions in the Psalms in order to help us understand what is going on in the life of the psalmist and how it relates to us in our current situation in our world. And, and the first question is, is found in verse 2. The psalmist says, when shall I come and appear before God? And you have to understand the context, because at that time in the worship of Israel, when you talked about coming and appearing before God, you were talking about coming to the temple. There was a temple located in Jerusalem, and that's where the men of Israel had to come three times a year to the three great festivals. And they would come and appear before God, and sacrifices would be presented to God, and worship would take place. And that's where you appeared before God was at the temple. 
And so when he asks this question, when shall I come and appear before God? What he's saying is, I'm not able to come to the temple right now. I'm not able to travel to Jerusalem right now. He talks about Mount Hermon, as we read up in um, verse 6, and it could be just it was distance, that he was so far away from Jerusalem, it was too far for him to travel. There are some hints in, in these Psalms that he could have been physically ill, and maybe because of his sickness, he was not able to travel down to Jerusalem to enjoy temple worship, or he may have been in exile. He may not have politically been able to come and to worship God because of exile. But whatever the reason, it's very clear in these psalms that the psalmist is distressed, the psalmist is discouraged because he cannot worship God in the temple at Jerusalem. Tell me that's not relevant for us here today because I'm sure some of you are distressed, maybe even discouraged, because you cannot physically gather together with the body of Christ and worship. But, but even in the midst of this, there is still hope. Because what we know as believers in Jesus Christ is that the temple is not a physical structure. And, and the temple is not a building. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 and 2 Corinthians 6 that we as believers, it says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sitting in this beautiful sanctuary here. There's no one in here right now, but I'm sitting in this beautiful sanctuary speaking to you on live stream. But this building is not the temple of God. We as believers are the temple of God. And even if this physical structure was destroyed, God's people would continue to endure. And so the psalmist was distressed because he could not get to the temple. But here's the good news. God is wherever you are. God is omnipresent. And God's presence is not limited or contained to a temple, to a building, to a sanctuary, to a physical structure. It's not like God lives in here. No. God lives in our hearts. And that's what we believe as followers of Christ. Let, let, let me remind you of a story in John chapter 4. You remember when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well, the, the Samaritan woman? This is what she said. She said, our fathers worshiped. I'm in John chapter 4, verse 20. She said, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And so what was Jesus saying here? It's not about worshiping in Samaria. It's not about worshiping in Jerusalem. It's not about a temple. It's not about a physical structure. It's about a God who is spirit, a God who is omnipresent, and a God who invites us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, I'm not minimizing the importance of physically gathering together. And once we're able to do that again, we are going to do that, and we're going to have a tremendous service together. But God is still God, even when you're not in this building. God is still God, even when you cannot gather in a physical structure. God is still your God. You, your body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you have a mediator. His name is Jesus Christ. And you can approach the Father, and you can pray to him, and you can worship him, and you can experience God even in your home. 
And that, that's what we believe as followers of Christ. Another question that we see in, in, in these Psalms, actually we see, them, we see this question twice in Psalm 42. It's found in verse 3 and then again in verse 10. And the question is, where is your God? And this was kind of a taunt from persecutors. And so here was the psalmist. He was not able to gather with the people of God in Jerusalem. He was not able to go down and enjoy temple worship. He was distressed. He was discouraged. And so evidently there were people in his ear persecuting him, taunting him, and saying, where is your God? And maybe even the psalmist, and it seems like that was some of his own questions to God. Maybe even the psalmist at times was wondering, where is my God? Maybe, maybe you're asking that question. And as you look out upon the horizon of life right now and you watch the media coverage and you get online and you see what the experts are saying, maybe you're thinking, where is God? Where is God in all of this? I'll tell you where he is. God is the same place he has always been. God is on the throne. Again, Revelation 19, 6, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. God is in control. God is sovereign. And God has a purpose in this. I don't know what that purpose is, but God has a purpose. Nothing in this world can happen without the permission of God. God has a purpose. Where is God? He's on his throne. Where is God? He's, he's also in my heart. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he's in, in your heart. And you can commune with him. And that God of hope can give you hope. And that's why the psalmist says three times in these two psalms, hope in God, hope in God, hope in God. Hope is not just a feeling. Hope is this God-given assurance that God is in control. It's this expectation, a, a deep-seated, lasting expectation that better days are ahead. And that's the hope that we're to be known for as followers of Christ. And we can have that hope because of what God is to us. It's interesting as you go through these two Psalms, what we find in a relationship with God. I, I see three things that we find in a relationship with God. One is security. In, in verse 9, he says, I say to God, my rock. Can you say that today? Can you refer to God as your rock? And when the Bible compares God to a rock, it's speaking of stability, consistency, faithfulness, his immutability, that he does not change. And, and we, we should say today as believers, God is my rock. He is the security. He is our confidence. And with all of the changes and all of the uncertainty and all of the fears, let me tell you what is not changing. God is not changing. And in God, we have security. And if you feel insecure, if you feel discouraged, look to God. Put your hope in God. He is your rock. Another thing we find in God is satisfaction. In verses 1 and 2, it says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You know, a deer, maybe this deer is fleeing from a predator. And this deer is going to the, to the water to refresh itself and to get a drink. And, and right now, you might feel overwhelmed by life. And you might feel kind of like you're hunted by the enemy. You need refreshed. You need renewed. You need joy and satisfaction. It's found in God. I hope you're thirsting for God. You know, what's so powerful about these psalms is you can tell the psalmist is discouraged, but that just causes him to seek God more. And sometimes when people get discouraged, they drift away from God and they don't seek God. 
But what we see with the psalmist, even though he has these feelings of discouragement, he's still seeking God, thirsting for God, crying out to God, and I hope you're doing the same. In, in Psalm 43, verse 4, speaking of finding our satisfaction in God, it says, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. God is not only my rock, God is my exceeding joy. Joy is not found in circumstances. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. I cannot always rejoice in my circumstances. I cannot even always rejoice in myself, but I can always rejoice in the Lord. He is my exceeding joy. And if you lack joy right now, find it in God. So in God, I find my security, I find my satisfaction, but also find my salvation. That's in that refrain. Uh, Psalm 42, verse 5, verse 11, again, Psalm 43, verse 5, but let me just read uh, the first time the f refrain occurs in Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. You see, God is my rock, God is my exceeding joy, and God is my salvation. He is my deliverance. And you know, sometimes in the Old Testament, that salvation is talking about deliverance from present trying circumstances. But we know in light of the New Testament, this salvation is not just about being delivered from circumstances, it's about being delivered from the penalty and power of sin. And we can be delivered from the penalty and power of sin through Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He was resurrected on the third day. And all who believe in him, all who place their faith in him will be forgiven of all of their sins and they will have the assurance of eternal life. In God, we find our salvation. Look, look at um, Psalm 43, verse 3. It says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let your light and your truth lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. So what is going to bring me to the dwelling of God? What is going to bring me to the holy hill of God? What is going to bring me into the very presence of God? It says it's going to be your light and your truth. Send out your light and your truth. I believe this refers to Jesus. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the truth. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And in a world full of darkness, where's the light? The light is in Jesus. And Jesus also says in the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when the psalmist prays, and, and I don't think the psalmist has a full understanding of even what he's asking. I don't think he was thinking of Jesus when he was writing this psalm, Psalm 43, verse 3. When he said, send out your light and your truth, he probably didn't understand the ramifications of what he was saying. Because even though the psalmist is writing and the psalmist is praying, the Holy Spirit is inspiring the, writer, the writings of Scripture. And in light of the canon, in light of fuller revelation found in the New Testament, I think we understand what that light is, what that truth is. It's Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's the truth. And it's Jesus that leads us to the holy hill. It's Jesus that leads us to the dwelling of God. God is this holy God that is unapproachable. We are finite. We are sinful. We are mortal. God is perfectly holy. And how am I going to have communion with God? How am I going to have a relationship with God? It's through a mediator who is the light, who is the truth, and that mediator is Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between man and God, and that man is Christ Jesus. You can read that in 1 Timothy 2.5. And so where is our hope? 
our hope is found in Jesus Christ. Well, let, let me end this message by asking this question. How do I maintain a spirit of hope during this time? I'm not suggesting it's easy. And it could get harder and harder as the days go on. But how do I maintain a spirit of hope? I think it's found in verse 8 of Psalm 42. He says, By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Let me say to you, keep praying, keep singing, keep trusting. Keep praying. It says that there is a prayer to the God of my life. Keep praying. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant or be steadfast in prayer. If, if you're going to maintain a spirit of hope, you have to maintain a faithful time of prayer because the God we serve is the God of hope. He's the one who gives hope, and he's the one who sustains hope within us and so if we're going to maintain a spirit of hope, we need to have regular communion with God. And so it's in prayer that we affirm that God is in control. It's in prayer that we cast our anxieties upon God. It's in prayer that we hear the voice of God and we have assurance given to us by God. And he reassures us, it's going to be okay. I am with you. I am sovereign. I am faithful. And so if you want to maintain a, a spirit of hope, keep praying. And you don't have to just pray by yourself. You can pray with your family. You can pick up the telephone and call someone and say, let's have a word of prayer over the phone. That would encourage them. It would encourage you. Keep praying. Keep singing. You say, well, we can't sing. We're not gathering for corporate worship right now. No, you can sing at home. This morning I sang, I am a child of God. It was so encouraging just to sing that song. I was all by myself. I'm not the greatest singer, but it encouraged me. Turn on some praise music at your home. Turn on some Christian music. Listen to the old hymns. Listen to the beautiful contemporary music. And let it feed your soul. Let it encourage you during this time. It says again in verse 8, it says, And at night his song is with me. God can give you a song in the night. He can give you a song. And some of the most powerful hymns and songs that we sing were birthed out of difficult circumstances. And I hope that God will give you a song in the night. Keep singing and then keep trusting. Keep trusting in the love of God. Verse 8 says, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love. The steadfast love of God. God's love is steadfast. That means it's unchanging, it's constant, it's perfect, it's unconditional. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's Lamentations chapter 3. And of course, that great hymn came out of that passage. Great is thy faithfulness. Sing that hymn. Keep trusting in God's love. Let me, let me read to you Romans 8. I think I read a few of these verses at the conclusion of last week's message, but I want to read a few more of these verses out of Romans 8. Romans 8 is a tremendous passage to read any time, but especially right now during these trying times. But in, in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, or I could add, or social distancing or the COVID-19 pandemic, can any of this separate us from the love of Christ? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am certain 
that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God's love. So again, in closing, how do you maintain a spirit of hope? Keep praying, keep singing, keep trusting in the love of God. Romans 15, 13, I refer to it at the beginning of this message. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This God of hope can give you joy and peace and he can also cause hope to overflow in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you have that hope today? Yes, the psalmist was discouraged. He may have even been depressed. But what did he say to himself? Hope in God, hope in God, hope in God. Put your hope in God. And if you do not have a personal relationship with God through the mediator, Jesus Christ, then you don't have any hope. This is the, this is the time to put your hope in God. This is the time to begin a personal relationship with God. You say, how do I do that? Well, you come to God just as you are. You confess that you have failed God, that you have sinned, that you have broken his commandments, that you're sorry for that, and that you believe that his son, Jesus Christ, is the son of God. He died on the cross for your sins, and that he was resurrected on the third day. And if you believe that and invite him into your heart, you will be forgiven. And you will have security, satisfaction, and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me for a closing word of prayer? God of hope, the giver of hope, and the sustainer of hope, our faith is in you. And Father, during this trying time, during this difficult time, during this COVID-19 pandemic, when there's anxiety, confusion, distress, discouragement, and even depression, Lord, would you resurrect hope in our lives? Would you sustain hope in our lives to believe that you're in control, to believe that better days are ahead, and to believe that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank you for your word. Be with the church. Be with our community. Be with our world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.